Hey there, guys. All right, today we are back with an exciting episode of Geography. Now, this time, North Korea, or Democratic People's Republic of Korea, I believe is the DPRK, what DPRK means. Before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. This is going to be an interesting episode because of the time in which it was recorded and released, because this would have been back when things with North Korea were getting... We're feeling a bit spicy in in uh, recent years. In the last couple years, though, it, North Korea hasn't been too spicy. But when this video was getting re was released, I believe things were pretty spicy. If I'm remembering my uh, my years right. So let's go ahead and dive right in. What's the biggest difference between North and South Korea? Well, for one, I'd say watch their news broadcasts and take note on how they talk about their leaders. As opposed to, Yeah, that and I think they have like this thing going on with conflict and something about a war, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's time to learn geography now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. We have reached our next set of twin countries. The first was the Congos, the last will be the Sudans. But for now, we have reached the Koreas. Now, unless you've been living under a rock, I'm sure you may have heard something about North Korea in the past decade, as it's been in the news quite a bit. As you know, I'm half Korean with roots in South Korea, and not only that, but I'm also American. So basically, I'm the worst possible candidate in the eyes of a North Korean to speak about their country. I will try to remain as unbiased and neutral in my delivery, addressing as much information as objectively as possible based off of pure data and facts. Dude, I really need to work on my Korean. I'm an embarrassment. Anyway, North Korea is sometimes referred to as the Hermit Kingdom, so there's always like a sense of mystery when it comes to what's inside. Fortunately, we have satellites and Google Earth. First hmm. of all, North Korea is located on the Korean Peninsula, connected to China's Liaoning and Jilin provinces, sandwiched between the Korea Bay and this sea, which be careful what you call it. Koreans and Chinese prefer the name East Sea, whereas the Japanese call it the Sea of Japan. Keep in mind, there's also an incredibly short 17 kilometer long border with Russia at the tri point with China. Along the border with Russia lies the friendship bridge and only north koreans and russians are allowed to take it with a transfer in mm. Vostok, this means you could essentially go all the way to moscow making it one of the longest train itineraries in the world at around nine days upon arrival the same deal exists with china in which there are three main border crossings the sino-korean friendship bridge the jian yalu river railway and the new yalu river bridge each of these bridges though are guarded and only let in certain government approved arrivals that have no set schedule the country is divided into three types of administrative divisions the nine provinces the tukbyoshi or special Special city of Ranson, as well as the capital Pyongyang, which also acts in its own entity. Pyongyang has the only international airport, Pyongyang Sunan International Airport, whereas the second largest city, Hamhung, and the third largest, Chongjin, both on the east coast, also have respectively the next largest domestic airports. Now we reach the most controversial part: the border with South Korea, literally like their own brothers. This 250-kilometer-long border, known as the DMZ or Demilitarized Zone, also sometimes called the 38th Parallel, this line was established by the Korean Armistice Agreement to serve as a buffer zone between the two nations giving more than a little half of the peninsula to North Korea. This means that essentially both countries claim that they are the rightful owners of the entire peninsula, or at least their government ruling systems should be the dominant ruling ideologies. At Panmunjom lies the joint security area, which acts as like the only connection between North and South Korea, with neutral conference rooms. It's actually kind of like a tourist spot in which people are allowed to go in under the supervision of a military guard. On top of that, it's estimated that the country has about 8,000 to 15,000 hidden underground facilities, including underground factories, underground air force hangars that cut through mountains, naval ports and artillery pieces in caves. North Korea, as we will soon find out, has quite a unique layout based heavily off of politics. Here you will find symbolism and imagery that relates to the government everywhere, even in the middle of remote farm villages. Every school and office building is required to have portraits of the late Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung on their walls. In Pyongyang, when they're not driving, they usually take the amazingly embellished underground metro system, which goes as far as 110 meters below the surface. Most foreigners that visit rarely get to see anything outside of Pyongyang. If you score a deal with the government, you might be allowed to visit Chongjin or the beaches of Wansan or the industrial city of Hamhung. Oh, and keep in mind, since 2015, they've actually started using their own time zone, UTC plus 830, which makes them 30 minutes behind South Korea and Japan. Why did they do that? Uh, because North Korea. That's why. Otherwise, this is the Fair part enough. where I usually mention places of interest, and honestly, out of my research, almost all of them were located in Pyongyang, such as the Korean yeah. People's Study House, the Ark of Triumph, Juche Tower, Cholima Statue, Ooh. the Victorious Fatherland War Museum, Manyongdae Funfair Amusement Park, Kumsusan Memorial Palace, Kyungi 
Gyeongsang Stadium, the largest in the world, the tallest building, Rugyong Hotel, the ideals of North Korean Workers' Party Monument. Otherwise, outside of Pyongyang and Myohyangsang, you have the Friendship Exhibition Hall. In general, North Korea is quite different from most places you'll encounter due to the regime honoring architecture and monuments. Aside from all that, though, the actual landscape has a few colorful sights to offer, which brings us to... Bum, bum, bum. Now, believe it or not, if you ever get the chance to see the landscape of rural North Korea, it will not disappoint you. I'll never be going to North Korea. First of all, North Korea is about 80% mountainous, with the largest ranges in the northeast being the Hamgyong and Namnim mountain chains. Now, when the two Koreas split up, the north side got the most treasured natural landmark, the highest peak on the entire Korean peninsula, Mount Pekdu. Well, part of it. China kind of got three quarters of it. Mount Pekdu, with its caldera lake, known as Heaven Lake, is actually an active volcano with the last eruption happening in 1903, and it's considered a sacred spot to all Koreans. To the west of Pekdu is the longest river that divides the border with China, the Amnok, or Yalu River, which empties into the Bay of Korea. Nonetheless, the Taedong River is probably the most important one as it flows directly through Pyongyang. About 70% of the country is forested, about 20% is arable for farming, which employs about a quarter of the entire population. Virtually every single crop field is under government jurisdiction as farmers must hand over a portion or quarter to the state. During the 90s, widespread flooding disasters caused famine, which killed off hundreds of thousands of people. And since then, North Korea has actually decided to quadruple their potato production in many places, replacing rice since potatoes grow much faster and easier. Speaking of which, I would argue that if you really want a taste of deep, true, non-commercialized traditional Korean cuisine, Cuisine, then the North Koreans probably have it a little bit more locked down better than South Korea. I'm sorry, South Korea, but it's kind of true. I mean, come on. Since when the hell was cheese ramyun a thing? And even though, admittedly, they do taste kind of good, kimchi was never originally intended to be made into a burger patty. Anyway, a traditional Korean meal will usually consist of multiple banchan, which are small seasoned side dishes placed in small dishes and bowls alongside your main plate. Typical dishes I'm sure many of you have already heard of, like bulgogi, kalbi, samgyeopsal, buchinge, bibimbap, are made in restaurants, sometimes in the homes of the elite. However, most people in North Korea don't actually eat meat that much except on public holidays or on special occasions due to the lack of access. North Koreans are also known for having the best version of my favorite food in the world, nengmyeon, ice cold starchy buckwheat noodles typically served with a half boiled egg, thin slices of brisket, cucumber radishes topped off with the right amount of vinegar and Korean spicy mustard. If I could go to North Korea just to try their nengmyeon, I would. Watch, I'm at customs at the airport and they're like, purpose of visit? Nengmyeon. Yeah, it's probably not gonna happen. Yo, Dennis Rodman, I need you to do me a favor. Almost all oil and no. petroleum is imported from China from a pipeline originating in Dadong along the border. And I think I think that's a good transition to start discussing the people and how and why they are the way they are. Oh, Kurom, Maraba, Murom, Pabokatan, Nigugin. And that will be discussed too. Bum, bum, bum. Now, let's be honest, when you hear North Korea, immediately images of the Kim regime and marching soldiers, military personnel, but for a couple minutes, try as hard as you can to put that aside and go deeper to a level that most people in the Western world don't really tap into. What is North Korea like outside of the news? Well, first of all, the country has about 25 million people and has the most active troops per population at nearly 48 per thousand people. With the exception of a very small group of Chinese, Japanese, and Westerners that have residency status, the country is almost completely homogenous at 99.99% ethnically Korean. That was the easiest pie chart I've ever made. In addition, mm -hmm. they also use North Korean one as their currency, even though foreigners can't use it. They use a Type C plug outlet, and they drive on the right side. Hold on, I'm gonna sneeze, and it ruins the bit. <laughs> okay, the bit was ruined, but I'm still going with it. Britain, and all the other countries that drive on the wrong side of the road. Even North Korea gets it right. It's in the name. It's a, it says it right there. Keep right. The right side. Driving on the left, it's wrong, man. It's just wrong. North Korea knows it, too. It's pretty sad, isn't it, Britain? And all the other countries, because I'm forgetting which other countries drive on the left. <laughs> The road. Let's quickly talk about the few non-North Koreans that are allowed to live in North Korea. The only real group of ethnic minorities that have inhabited the peninsula prior to war times would be the Jegasun people, descendants of Manchurian lay monks from China that got married and settled in the area. Otherwise, modern Chinese people known as Hua Chao have been able to establish residencies in North Korea. However, since the 80s, more have repatriated back to China. Otherwise, a very small community of only a couple hundred Indians, Japanese, and yes, even about 200 Americans live in North Korea. Some of them are prisoners of war, some are defectors, but most of these people are serving 
serving in humanitarian sectors, providing things like medical and educational uh. aid. The country has virtually no standardized immigration policy other than, will the president allow you in? Which is how these two people got in. Remember the Equatorial Guinea episode? We talked about the dictator Francisco Macias? Well, he made a deal with Kim Il-sung and sent his kids to North Korea shortly before he was assassinated. Yeah, his daughter Monique was raised alongside the regime, personally meeting Kim multiple times. She speaks fluent Korean and is alive today. She wrote a book and does speaking tours. Then you huh. have this guy who goes by his Korean name, Cho Sun Il. He's the only Westerner to officially work for the regime. It took him over 10 years to gain the confidence of the government. He is head of the Korean Friendship Association and is North Korea's unofficial ambassador to the world. What's even more interesting are the North Koreans living abroad. Today, there's a community of North Korean descended people in Japan known as the Zainichi Koreans. They have their own pro Pyongyang operated schools and teach lessons in Korean with a strong pro North Korean curriculum in Japan. Oh. Weird, huh? Also, yeah. there's estimated to be a little more than 20,000 defectors living in South Korea. And there are quite a few living in the U.S. as well. Remember that letter I got on Flag Friday? In North Korea, they speak, of course, Korean, but a distinct North Korean dialect, which is actually more kind of like a proper traditional way of speaking. Whereas the Korean spoken in South Korea utilizes a plethora of loan words from English and to some extent Chinese. For example, in South Korea, juice is juice. In North Korea, kwaldanmul, which translates to something like fruit sweet water. In South Korea, ice cream. In North Korea, orom kwaja, which means something like ice sweet tree. It's kind of like how Icelandic and Faroese are closer to ancient Norse than Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian. Now, being a North Korean in North Korea is very different from being a citizen of most other places on earth. First thing you have to know is juche. This word describes the ideology of North Korea started by its founder Kim Il-sung. Juche translates to something along the lines of self-reliance. What's interesting is that North Korea even goes by the juche year, not the Gregorian calendar. All the years start on Kim Il-sung's birthday April 15th, 1912, making 2018 the year 106 for them. All resources follow the Sungun Chongji policy, which gives ration priority to the military. They have the largest military budget per GDP in the world at nearly 23%. Damn. Both men and women are required to serve conscription, and with 1.2 million active, this makes North Korea the country with the fourth largest military after China, the US, and India. In elementary school, children are taught almost immediately that the enemy is the West, and specifically the USA. One of their favorite cartoons being Squirrel and Hedgehog, anthropomorphic depictions of North Korea Koreans versus the Japanese weasels, South Korean mice, and the American wolves. And don't forget good old Russia bear that the squirrels used to depend on for help as an ally, but he got too drunk and so they dropped him. Now I'm pretty sure you're all- what the fuck? All aware of how much restriction there is in North Korea on everyday commodities that we in the West are accustomed to, like YouTube. A list of things restricted in North Korea include overly provocative clothing, any website outside of North Korea's Kwangmyung internet service, movies and music from the outside, Coca-Cola, anything related to or being LGBT, international travel, unless you are a high-ranked official with permission from the government, domestic travel between cities, unless you have a permit, magazines, hair dye, or a haircut that does not fit one of the 28 approved styles for men and women, any kind of religious literature. They did just legalize certain cell phones, though. Progress! Speaking of which, North Korea is essentially yeah. an enforced atheistic state, although some would argue that it's more like a person reverence state. Although the constitution says it allows religious freedom, religion is heavily restricted and chastised. Anyone owning a piece of religious literature, proselytizing, or worshipping anywhere outside of the government sanctioned and heavily monitored churches will be punished severely. Numbers are hard to come by since the Christian community is heavily concealed and underground, but studies show that there could be anywhere between 300,000 to half a million Christians residing in North Korea to this day. North Korea is a very elitist run country. The top and most privileged people live in Pyongyang. Most people that live in the city are expected to excel in all fields of academia and the arts. Most people there play at least one instrument and have some kind of skill that can attribute to the furtherance of North Korea's cultural identity. And if the government feels like it, they will hold the Arirang Mass Games, the largest of its kind according to the Guinness Book of World Records. Here students as young as five from one of the top eight elite schools of Pyongyang participate in an extravagant colorful performance of exquisitely choreographed acrobatics, arts, dance, and music. With Dude, mental health in Korea has to Fucking terrible for the kids, man. Like, expectation to excel that much. Also, if you're expecting them, I feel like if the idea of the expectation of excelling in all fields of academia means that the bar to excelling must be lower, right? There's no fucking way that. Yeah.
with an amazing card mosaic wall, literally controlled by individual students flipping colored panels, creating a massive moving image. It's like a living TV and each pixel is a person. Okay, history time. If we really want to go back and discuss the entire history of the Korean Peninsula, it kind of goes like this. Jelmun and Mumun pottery period, Korean Neolithic period, Korean Bronze Age, Korean Iron Age, First Kingdom of Gojoseon was founded along with the Jin state, the Proto Three Kingdoms period, the actual Three Kingdoms period of Goguryeo, <laughs> Baekje and Shila, Shila and Balhae split up, the latter Three Kingdoms, United Dynastic period of Goryeo, Joseon and Korean Empire, World War II Japanese occupation, there's a weird provisional government thing hosted in China, and then this is where things get complicated. Basically, Russia and China supported the North and the US and the UN with its allies for the South. The Korean War, or as the North Koreans call it, the Victorious Fatherland Liberation War, was essentially a war caused by political ideology. Basically, there are arguments on who exactly shot the first fire, but what we do know is that on Sunday, June 25th, 1950, North Korea's Korean People's Army crossed the 38th parallel behind artillery fire, and in three months pushed South Korean and American forces all the way down to Busan. Then the US and UN forces retaliated. They pushed the North Koreans all the way back up with a vicious counterattack. Finally, there was a stalemate and armistice in 1954, and the DMZ was set up, officially separating the two Koreas. Today, North Korea is in an interesting situation. If you talk to a North Korean, they will tell you, yes, anyone disrespecting leaders will be punished. Which brings us to Kim Jong-un. I feel like we kind of have to do a flowchart like we did in the Columbia episode. Can we do that, Ken? Sure. It all started with this guy, Kim Il-sung, father of North Korea. Kim Il-sung had six children from two wives. His oldest son, Kim Jong-il, took over after him when he passed away in 1994. The country wept. Kim Jong-il was known for being the man that essentially, against UN policies, made North Korea a nuclear state by supposedly developing nuclear warheads. He died in 2011. The country wept again. He had six children from three different women. The oldest son was supposed to inherit the nation, but apparently Kim Jong-nam was considered an embarrassment and he lived in exile. The next oldest son, Kim Jong-chul, was deemed as not fit for the job, so that left the youngest son, Kim Jong-un, to take over the throne. Kim Jong-un was brought to power after his father's death, and in 2013, Kim Jong-un executed his aunt's husband under grounds of alleged corruption and treason. His half-brother, Kim Jong-nam, was assassinated in Kuala Lumpur. Details are still a little shady behind it. He then I forgot about that. <laughs> continued his father's work by doing a series of missile tests on Mount Mantop. So, yeah, there's a lot of things going on in North Korean politics, and it only gets more interesting when we talk about their relationship to the outside world. Let's cover that now. Bum, bum, bum. North Korea is known for being one of the most isolated nations on Earth. However, they do actually have diplomatic missions with outside states. First of all, North Korea has made kind of interesting business ties with various African nations. They are known for being the creators of various statues like the ones in Zimbabwe, Namibia, Mozambique, even Senegal's resistant monument, the largest statue in Africa. Generally, they seem to have ties with nations that also have ties to communism or are still under communist governments. In the past, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam were pretty close allies. However, in the past, these states have adopted a more capitalistic substructure in their legislation legislations, which has distanced them from North Korea over the years. You would think that the USA and UK would have bad ties, but surprisingly, the UK has an embassy in North Korea. North Korea actually does have third-party agreements under the table that allows private investors to do business with them. Whenever North Korea says they're closing off to the Americans, there's always kind of like a small loophole that they kind of let slide, and by that I mean Dennis Rodman. North hmm. Korea might say that their best friends would kind of technically be China and Russia. However, China and Russia are a little weary of hanging out with them. Both countries are their largest suppliers of import and export, as well as outside communication, even though that is very restricted as well. When it comes to South Korea, though, the North has kind of like a strange, I love you, but I hate everything you stand for type of a relationship. These two are basically identical twins, separated at birth, raised by incredibly different foster parents. North Koreans kind of view South Koreans as American puppets that condone Western imperialist ideologies. Basically, the narrative for the North Koreans is, withdraw your ties and sanctions to the Americans, and we can reunify, whereas the South is like, get rid of Kim Jong-un and join our system, and then we can unify. In conclusion, yes, North Korea has quite a reputation around the world for being a mysterious, isolated nation of enigma brimming with controversy and conflict, but they also have a unique story that tells us how ideology can play one of, if not one of the most important roles on how we people will live on the planet. I don't know what the future will hold for North Korea and South Korea, but let's hope that somehow, some way, peace can be the final result. Stay tuned, twin number two, South Korea is coming up next, and my mom will be in it! And that was Geography Now, North Korea, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Got nothing to add here at the end. Uh, it's North Korea. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.